Hi everyone, welcome to Crap Chocolate TV. My name is Dylan, this is Lorenzo. Hi there. Lorenzo is somebody that we've been working with for at least uh, five or six years on the equipment end, which is how we actually make chocolate. So I figured that it would be fun to talk to Lorenzo about a lot of the equipment we use and then a lot of what industrial chocolate looks like as well as things like starting from cocoa liquor and maybe starting from powder, which are areas of the chocolate world that are by far the largest. And maybe you could tell me some percentages of what percentage of chocolate out there is actually from powder or from liquor versus what we all understand better, which would be beans. So yeah, wait, take it from there. I don't know. So. Hello everyone, uh, I am uh, a manufacturer of equipment uh, and uh, we serve uh, both the bean to bar industry and uh, the in industries that make chocolate uh, out of uh, liquor and butter. They are very different uh, and the approach is very different. I don't know the figures of uh, uh, how much chocolate is made out of liquor or, or, or beans or is uh, acquired as uh, couverture. Uh, I can tell that among our customers, 50% um, make chocolate uh, with beans and 50% uh, they are either uh, cocoa liquor and butter or vegetable fats. And, and fat. that's changed um, in the more recent years, right? There's more and more customers that are classified as bean to bar. Yes. It, the, it, the, 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 the shift has been mostly within small makers uh, that were uh, just buying couverture especially in Europe, uh, existing companies maybe since uh, generations and at some point uh, they catch this uh, new wave coming from America and they are looking again into the whole process. This uh, changed uh, in the last uh, five years, more or less, uh, much later than, than America. So the, 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 the wave arrived and uh, the approach is slightly different uh, uh, less radical if uh, if i can say that uh, many of these so makers, when you say less radical the means, bean to bar scene is less radical than it was no, or less radical than the in industrial europe, guys in no no within the bean to bar industry uh, in europe uh, they are uh, less strict for example on the use of certain ingredients like lecithin for example they use maybe sunflower lecithin but a lot of bean to bar makers do that because of the application of the chocolate, for example. Many of them, they do enrobing. And uh, doing enrobing uh, without uh, lecithin, and I don't even consider without added cocoa butter, would be almost impossible. So even uh, the, the approach has been different uh, even within the bean to bar industry. Coming back to your question, uh, I would say that the majority still of the chocolate makers, they don't make their chocolate. They buy that. They buy that from uh, companies uh, like Barry Calebo or Cargill or Blommers uh, in the US. And that's fine uh, because we also make molding lines. So uh, for us, everything is okay. Uh, what we are trying to push, even for their own good, I'm talking about the industrial makers, is that they can make chocolate maybe not from beans, which is probably the most expensive uh, uh, way to, to get your chocolate, but from semi-ready ingredients like cocoa liquor and cocoa butter. Because it's so affordable to buy cocoa liquor and then finish the process on your own if you have it's, any type of scale. It's the cheapest way to make chocolate. Let's say that you spend, uh, I'm talking with metrics, but let's say that you spend five, six, seven, eight dollars a kilogram to buy couverture. If you make it uh, with liquor and butter, it's going to cost 50% of that. So this is the best way to have uh, a, an economy and to control your recipe. And this is why companies all over the world that you guys work with, as soon as they hit scale in the ice cream world and need enough of their own chocolate, they are switching to cocoa liquor lines yes. where they would buy a ball mill, starting from a ball mill, yes. and then some type of pump that would transfer sugar and they would make their recipe and complete it. That's exactly the case. It depends on the scale. We have even customers that make maybe 500 kilos a day, because already that 
is uh, is worth to consider as uh, a, a switch from uh, buying curvature to make it uh, oh, okay. on their own. That's an interesting S metric. Some yes, let's say that twenty metric tons is the the the, the limit. Under that, maybe it's not convenient. Over that is already twenty metric tons a year. A year, yes. And uh, I would say that fifty percent of our customers, independently from the industry, it can be confection, so bars, or users of chocolate for other industry like ice cream, as you mentioned, or bakery, or uh, uh, some uh, uh, niche industries like uh, healthy uh, products, candy bars. Uh, uh, I mean, cereal bars or um, uh, nutrition products uh, or even uh, the ingredient suppliers uh, which serve uh, pastries, bakeries, uh, small confectioners with their uh, ingredients which they acquire from someone else. They have the convenience to make them on their own. We're talking about chocolate, we're talking about fillings as well. Products like spreads and, and similar stuff which are not, uh, by the law, they are not chocolate but they are ingredients for the chocolate and the bakery and the ice cream industry so those are our industrial type of, of, of customers and these would be lines up to how many kilos an hour uh, 1200 kilos an hour it's our maximum level so one about a ton an hour uh, about um, one metric ton per hour exactly so uh, this is uh, the biggest size of, uh, of, of line that we manufacture and it starts from the preparation of the ingredients so the melting of the liquor, the butter, uh, any other uh, liquid ingredient like uh, hazelnut paste, the loading uh, of those ingredients into a mixer, and then the steps of refining and conching in a much more automatic way than the bean to bar industry. So this is one of the reasons because this type of solution uh, makes the product cheaper than the, the bean to bar, because in the bean to bar industry you have still for some makers a lot of labor involved so if you check the actual cost of manufacture of one kilogram of bean to bar chocolate one kilogram of chocolate made out of liquor and butter and one kilogram of uh, curvature the cheapest way is uh, liquor and butter right and that'd be because somebody like Cargill or Calibo is processing on such a huge scale like what are they roasting three tons an hour Maybe more sometimes. Five, six tons an hour. And then they convert it into liquor, put it in, in bags and boxes, and then someone would buy a pallet of, or a of container. That, or, of that. or a container. And it's not just them, because a lot of countries at the origin are now doing this, ty this type of job. So it's not given that you find blended liquors on the market. You can find even single origin. Among our customers, in the countries manufacturing cacao, we have a lot of those that just do liquor or liquor and butter and they sell it to the US or to uh, uh, Europe. And there are even much bigger uh, uh, companies that do that uh, in a larger scale than our uh, bean to bar customers uh, in cacao countries. And uh, the cocoa, uh, the cocoa mass and cocoa butter, they tend to be a commodity as uh, yeah, sure. cacao beans. So, but that would not be the lowest part. The lowest would probably uh, maybe be starting with powder and that, some type of vegetable fat. That's another story. So uh, something like compound. Would you would you mind explaining briefly what difference. compound chocolate is versus compound chocolate is whatever is not uh, uh, defined chocolate by the law. U.S., Europe. And almost every country have a, leg a legislation defining what chocolate is. Uh, it's all coming Which from... Which is something like 11% cocoa in, mass and butter. In the US. In Europe is different. In Europe is different uh, and uh, in the UK is different. Australia is different. Even India is different. And my understanding is it's not that different though. It's just the way that raw materials are measured. Some it is different. For example, the cacao content in the U.S. to define a product chocolate is much lower than Europe. I, I heard that's not necessarily true because it depends on when you're looking at it as a raw material. So something like starting from beans or from or powder. Yeah. So uh, Europe looks at it as beans, even if they're starting from powder, and so they're able to write a much higher 
percentage, even though it's not necessarily true. It's you, slightly you correct me there. If, the percentage in Europe to define a product chocolate is slightly higher. I know both because uh, uh, this type of definitions uh, uh, are very important because many of my customers they play very tight on these definitions because their products tend not to be uh, uh, very expensive. Mm -hmm. So right, they're playing with their margins very they are closely. Playing with their, like, their for example, I think in the U.S. it would be you'd be measuring the actual milk powder weight, whereas in Europe you could actually use the weight of the milk yeah. instead of the powder, even though you're adding powder. So those are it uh, looks like you're adding a lot more by. In, the, in, the volume in, of the uh, these the this type of this type of let's say uh, definitions are uh, uh, tricky. They can be tricky. One advice that I give uh, to many chocolate makers, especially the newcomers, uh, is to study those those laws in the U.S. or uh, in Europe, because uh, many of them are playing uh, uh, in in an area which is a kind of a gray area. I I will say something that is not going to be popular, but. <laughs> In some places, uh, what some people call uh, vegan chocolate, vegan milk chocolate, cannot be called chocolate because it can't even be called chocolate, yes, not just vegan. It's it cannot be called chocolate at all because, for example, in North America and in Europe, is very strict the definition of milk chocolate, and it has to be dairy milk. It cannot be oat milk. It cannot be uh, soy milk. Mm. Or any other type of substitute. So, big companies that are playing with that uh, type of market, they don't put chocolate on their label. They invent a name, and this is something that small makers should be careful with. And talking about that, we were speaking before about this topic. What uh, the, what I see among the, the bean to bar makers is a kind of uh, a rejection. Of the. Uh... Sorry, I brought you these. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, mom. A kind of a, a rejection of uh, the accumulated knowledge that the industry has, which is wrong. Uh, uh, many chocolate makers, especially the small ones, they think that whatever comes from industrial makers is false, is fake. Yeah. Which is not true. The, the goal of these companies was different, but the achievements that they, they, they got through the years, the knowledge that has been accumulated is very important. So we, we right. cannot reject that. We need to borrow from it. We, we need Certain to borrow. Things. We need to, to, to learn. We learned that as manufacturers of equipment from Bean to Bar and from industrial makers. And any of the two is taking advantage of some of the modification. I give you an example. You have our machines. You know that uh, uh, they can be connected to internet. We can connect to them to uh, help you with maintenance and everything. Reprogramming These updates. Updates. Those things uh, were not available before for small makers. They are available because we have that type of, of knowledge from industrial lines, and at the same time. Industrial lines now they enjoy some improvements on the machines that we had to have because of the difficult products that the bean to bar industry is doing. I think there's a false notion that big equipment and big scale equals poor quality, mm -hmm. which just isn't true because it really depends on the raw materials the you're starting with. And so, in a lot of ways, our chocolate improved significantly by using bigger and better equipment. Not only did we save a lot of labor time, and we, we bought our time back by buying nice machines, um, it allowed us to do things that were more important for humans to do, and we made less mistakes because we touched the product less time, and the equipment did a better job refining or pinpointing what it was supposed to do, whether it was ball milling to reduce micron size at an even rate, things like that. So the big guys have excellent machines, they're just not in the same business model that we're in. So by borrowing their equipment and understanding of throughput and linking everything together, they're good. You reduce a lot of your costs so that you can actually be a successful and thriving business and, and affect whether it's craft chocolate or buying from farmers or planting more trees or whatever you're trying to achieve through your business. The you know, more, that's kind of how I look at it. 
I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, being more uh, competitive on the market uh, with uh, this type of chocolate, which is very expensive, we have to say that. If you buy a bar of an excellent chocolate in Europe, uh, maybe 70 grams, it's costing one, two euros, two euros, let's say. Uh, been to bar bar, maybe it's four or five times that, that, that money. Right, and, and most of that cost would be... Labor. Somebody's labored to do it in a grinder this big or, or even that big. Yeah. It's just extremely inefficient. Absolutely, absolutely. So, of course, it's not... Uh, automation is expensive. It has to make sense as well. Uh, you are one of the examples of those companies that grew with, uh, with a sense over time. Uh, you invested in automation and uh, you, you became more available. It's not just a, a matter of uh, cost. It's also a matter of productivity also of quality. Uh, right. Machines if, are tools. If craft the chocolate's world. gonna have a place, it's gotta be able to actually get out there and fill the store shelves. Yes. And if craft chocolate is so small that the store can't rely on the order showing up on time, that, 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 it's just never gonna point. have a place. I agree with that. Uh, uh, productivity and cost are uh, things that automation can solve easily. And uh, also you spoke about this type of uh, uh, works that are uh, repetitive and human beings uh, at some point uh, they don't pay the same attention over time and they can make mistakes automation is there for those things the humans and this is something i i want to clarify very well that, that, that's a personal opinion what what's the difference between uh, bean to bar uh, or craft uh, chocolate and uh, industrial chocolate you can still uh, make a lot of mistakes, even with automation, when you are a bean to bar maker. And that's part of the You can of make much story. bigger mistakes. Yes. Yeah. You, can, you can spoil a product. Your, decision, your decisions are still affecting the final result. In an industrial situation, it's very difficult to affect the final result because everything is standardized. And... Uh, it's, it's not a, a negative uh, 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 aspect. I don't say that this is negative. It's just different. And uh, uh, both words are learning from each other. I can say that, in my opinion, industrial makers are learning more from bean to bar than the other way around. Right. How Some do, makers hey, okay, are... Okay, so I, in what ways? I haven't got my ideas, I, but... I told you, uh, whatever comes from the industrial research is rejected by most of the bean to bar makers. It's false, it's fake, uh, oh, it's Nestle, oh, it's Barry Calebo, oh, it's Cargill, so I don't trust them. Instead, bigger manufacturers are all looking at bean to bar. They know about that. And what Many, do you think they're learning from? What, what are they actually watching besides just the little industry as at, like a fraction of a percentage? They are looking at the growth. Right. They know numbers. They play a lot with numbers, something that bean to bar makers don't do. And uh, looking at numbers and looking at the rate of growth of, of, of the bean to bar industry surprised everyone. For them, it made no sense at the beginning, but now they are looking at that sense. And many of these companies, they keep buying couverture or making chocolate from liquor and butter, but they start a small unit. Yeah. Of bean to bar manufacturing. I've noticed that mainly at the Salon du Chocolat in Paris. Yes. The first year I went was maybe like 2000, I don't know, 14 or 15. And I think I was one, I was, it was Manoa Chocolate and Guitard. Yeah. Were the only ones from the US. But then there was almost no bean to bar makers in the entire show, which I was shocked by. And then a few years later, they created a bean to bar village area yeah. because so much demand had come in and so many of the people that came to the show, which I don't know how many tens of thousands go to that show, were most interested in the little producers who were talking about how they source beans and how they made chocolate. It's a better story. And then they story. would go around and ask the chocolatiers with the big names. Do you make your chocolate? Yeah, so how do you make your chocolate? What machine do you use? And they're like, no, no, we don't make our own chocolate. And there was so much less interest in what they were actually doing. So they're almost being forced into manufacturing their own product, which I'd imagine you're seeing the results of as they buy machines from you. They are. They are. It's a true story. I told you. The bean to bar for us started in North America and in cacao countries. 
and now Europe is booming. So, right. So, so can you give us an, uh, maybe a snapshot picture of what the U.S. looks like and what Europe looks like, or even globally, because you follow it more closely than anyone I know on a global um, perspective of what craft chocolate is, or bean to bar on a small scale. So, uh, U.S. Uh, had uh, a big spike, let's say five, uh, seven years ago, when uh, tiny machines uh, were not enough anymore. So a lot of investments, uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, new factories, even people starting from zero at a higher level, not at the Stone Melanger tabletop level. Uh, and as I told you, uh, more focused uh, on bars, if I can say, and um, uh, on this uh, clean label. Europe has some makers following the American wave, starting from many different industries, many different types of jobs, and getting into chocolate using you, meaning you, Dylan, or some other uh, uh, manufacturers like Dandelion, for example, as models. And uh, then there is uh, the other type of uh, bean to bar maker, which is maybe at the fifth generation, fourth generation, mm -hmm. uh, a, a chocolate company that abandoned the manufacture of chocolate uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago because someone came there with a nice curvature, uh, solving many problems. You know how hard it is to run a company processing cacao beans. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of extra steps if yeah. you start with beans. Yeah, and the chocolate is unpredictable. So the manufacturer can give you even, you, you, you think that you have done every step all the same and something is different. While when you buy coverture, this happens not as often or I would say almost sure, never. Sure, the big guys create an but, extremely consistent product, which absolutely. is so hard to do. When you're small. And when you don't blend, and but when even you, when you're big, I, I can see it being a major challenge, which is why they have to buy from what six different origins yes, and blend, and then tweak that every year. Yeah. So uh, they and what 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 is important, as you said, they understood that there is a demand for a better story behind everything. This is uh, uh, this this belongs to the chocolate industry, to the craft beer specialty coffee, the gin industry now, which is uh, very popular. Uh, so people are looking for a story as well. And if you are able to tell that story, uh, you, you catch more of the consumers. And so this is what the giants are looking into. So I was surprised in, uh, in I don't remember if it was the last uh, exhibition in Paris. No, it was before. I saw a video from Barry Calebo. They were using bean to bar as a slogan Barry yeah. Carabo, oh, they are processing I think Meiji was the first to do it yes, they, a they, few years back, five true. years ago or something which is true, they are making chocolate from bean to bar but the yep. concept was different uh, but they know that this is this is selling so to the bean to bar makers I say do as they do with you uh, they learn from you you should learn something from them then coming back to your question at the beginning uh, what is compound and what is uh, used uh, for. Uh, in the industrial chocolate, uh, some products uh, have uh, some characteristics that cannot be matched by chocolate made with cocoa butter. So, uh, and also some costs are not uh, uh, matchable by a chocolate made out of liquor and butter, or let's not talk about chocolate from beans. So many productions, I don't know, in, especially in the bakery industry, for enrobing, for dipping, they use, instead of cocoa liquor and cocoa butter, they use cocoa powder, which is uh, the dry part of cacao coming out uh, of uh, the cocoa butter presses. You uh, press cocoa liquor, you take out the butter, and uh, the solids uh, are then, they, they come out in the shape of a, of a cake. It's a hard disk which is then ground into a powder. And that is uh, a, an ingredient that mixed with uh, vegetable fats like uh, coconut oil or uh, palm kernel palm, oil. Palm oils. Uh, they, they can make something that 
taste like chocolate, not not so intense, but decent, uh, and uh, they are much much cheaper than any on, of the chocolates that are defined chocolates Which by the law. I believe is what mostly would go into something like ice cream. Ice cream uh, is that one of the half biggest and a half. consumers of. Of compound and compound bakery chocolate. industry, bakery industry as well. Uh, so um, whatever uh, is enrobing, whatever enrobing of uh, wafers, uh, cakes, uh, I will use a technical uh, concept: molded ice cream. Those uh, ice cream that are um, in, in America, you call them uh, popsicles, mm -hmm. dipped in chocolate. The layer of chocolate has to be so thin that you would have to use if it was real chocolate so much, so much butter. cocoa butter yeah. and that would make it would make it so expensive instead coconut oil cocoa powder sugar makes it uh, extremely cheap right and then it and doesn't bloom it doesn't bloom but that, that that because it's frozen there is another important thing it doesn't crack mm. cocoa butter would crack coconut oil palm kernel oil they don't there are some definitions for the various vegetable fats, cocoa butter replaces, cocoa butter substitutes, uh, depending on their physical structure. Uh, the cheapest are the cocoa butter substitutes, which are uh, mostly lauric fats, like coconut oil and palm kernel oil, the nut of, of the, the palm fruit. Uh, they are uh, very cheap. And uh, for some applications, they are uh, still compulsory. And this is... Uh, I would say one fourth of the, let's say one fourth, even one third of the total chocolate production, although this is not actual chocolate by the law. Whatever contains more than 5% of certain vegetable fats cannot be defined as chocolate anymore. So um, this is a part of the industry. And as you said, we provide them the same tools that we provide to people like you. You have a chocolate which is considered a the best chocolate in bean to bar chocolate in the world not my world some people take you as a model and uh, they they buy our machines because they taste your chocolate and uh, they are amazed by that right and that's bean to bar or craft chocolate borrowing from industrial chocolate saying oh they've already figured out how to make really nice texture yeah. and enhance flavor so exactly you, you make it very fine very smooth which is uh, a, a, an achievement for uh, most of the bean to bars because uh, uh, stone melanges they cannot achieve that type of fineness. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. In three three days, you can maybe get close to around twenty microns. Yes. Things are not that consistent as far as the distribution curve of, yes. of microns. And Absolutely. then in three hours, we do one hundred and twenty kilos perfectly. Fifteen microns. And then the same equipment is used to make uh, the cheapest chocolate for uh, the the spray of, of cones for the impermeabiliza impermeabilization of the cone for, uh, for ice cream, which is uh, probably the worst thing that our machines make. Mm -hmm. And the technology is the same. So the, the way you use the, the, the tools is very important, the ingredients that you use. So this, and I agree with you, this is the huge difference between uh, the craft industry and, and industrial manufacture. The, apart the story that you tell, but the ingredients that you use. So any tool can be used uh, in, in many ways. Uh, the way you use that uh, is noble and uh, it gives you incredible, incre incredible results, but you can use it uh, even uh, in a different way. And there's nothing uh, wrong with that. I mean, I'm not judging uh, the, the quality of the products. They have two different applications. Your chocolate would, not, would make any product uh, enrobed with that or uh, dipped with that extremely expensive. It's, it's a different market. Right. So uh, we say, uh, one of my customers said that the sun is there for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, room for everybody. Yes. So um, I think one question you guys touched on it quite a bit, um, and a question we get a lot, is when to switch from the melanges, which are the most common with bean to bar, to the ball mill. You know, because it's it's such a it's such a big leap in price and in scale, and that's something people are always asking because they know the ball mill is so good at achieving the fine texture and stuff. Yeah, 
So going, going from a stone melanger like this, where it does 25 kilos every three, sometimes four days after you've had it for a while, we had two of them before we then jumped to a ball mill. But when you jump to a ball mill, you need to be on the ground floor. You need, well, you, it helps to be on the ground floor. You need three phase power. You need a pre-refiner. And then you need uh, a, a well, generally a conch. Yeah. And so it's a huge financial step up and starts to be real manufacturing for the first time. I would say there's probably a certain amount of tons that you would want to process. We got a loan at a great interest rate, which yeah. is why we ended up s skipping multiple steps by doing yeah, that process. Did. And then um, it really stabilized the business once we found our feet again. Mm -hmm. And everything started to work better because the idea for Manoa Chocolate is to try and continue to grow and, and be a large chocolate manufacturer. So I guess it depends on what someone would want to be. Does someone want to stay with two or three stone melangers or do they want to get big? Um, I would imagine at least having four or maybe more of those before going to a ball mill. And I wouldn't get the 50 kilo one. I would definitely get the <laughs> 130 just because you will grow into it. And it's yeah. not that much more money to get the bigger model. And it's something that I've continued to learn is always buy the bigger machine if you can because you will grow into it. And if you, if you buy what you need, you're stuck. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, and again, uh, using Stone Melanger has nothing wrong. If, you, for example, you have a retail space, you don't want to grow. I have in my mind a, a very nice chocolate maker here in the US. Uh, she's very happy with what she has. She has a shop. Uh, she makes a wonderful chocolate. She doesn't need productivity. She doesn't want to grow. And that's a model. In her shop, she sells chocolate and other stuff. Nice. Right. Uh, but if you, if you want to be profitable only on chocolate, and uh, you, you need to grow, you need to have automation, and, because the sustainability of this business is based on the fact that the company can pay the bills, can pay the salary of the owner, not just of the employees, and maybe can make profits, which is the purpose of every So we, we have an intern that you met yesterday here. He just got here a few days ago, and he's looking at starting a chocolate factory, and I asked him, how much money do you want to make per year? Because mm -hmm. that kind of determines how big your company will be and how, much, how many tons you have to produce and what kind of equipment you need. Um, so, and, and it's important to remember that when you buy bigger machines, you've just freed yourself up to go do the more important things like Selling. sell the chocolate so you can actually yeah. stay in business. Yeah, that's one of my sentences. Uh, uh, even if the equipment uh, is maybe too large at the beginning and you have to run it once per week or once each mm -hmm. two weeks, it doesn't matter because instead of being stuck sorting beans or... Uh, uh, Reprocessing nibs. Slowly on. loading nibs into a grinder. Exactly. Grinder. You can uh, look for customers. You can explain your product. You can talk with the suppliers. You can go face travel. to face and do the human yeah. interactions. Which is extremely important. Right. So this is one of the reasons I'm here. <laughs> yeah. And the, the bigger your machines are, the, the faster you'll end up growing into them because you that's just the way it seems to work. Just like yeah. when you have a certain amount of space, you fill it in before you know it. Ah, it's been that, like that, that every single time. Yeah. You are a particular case with that, but... Uh, I think it works that way for almost everybody, though. Yeah, true. Uh, other makers are like that. Some others uh, were not uh, And then successful. one of the important things to remember is just the amount of storage that's needed. Yeah. Oh, yes. The equipment is not... Uh, your space is not... As the investment cannot be just the equipment, even your space cannot be just the equipment. Uh, you need a lot of space for uh, uh, ingredients, finished product, packaging... Uh, a, a tiny warehouse for the tools. Uh, so right. So so going back to what Carson was asking, when do you think it makes sense to switch? Because you talk people out of buying your equipment we do. fairly often because yes. they're just it doesn't justify it at that point. No, but I mean, so they, when they, do you they think aim, that makes they sense? They aim to a scale uh, which is uh, so big, maybe as a first or as a second step, which would kill them. So this uh, cooling down uh, a customer is very important. To keep having that customer for a longer time than just one purchase. So um, 
uh, I would say that uh, when you are already making uh, two, three tons per year of chocolate, metric tons, uh, you can look to something bigger. Uh, just to, again, to manufacture more, to be, uh, uh, I don't say cheaper, but more affordable. And uh, these are important uh, factors because uh, you might have a good product and someone at, at some point can knock at your door and ask for uh, a couple of pallets to be delivered uh, right. within a month. And you need maybe three months to make one pallet and mm -hmm. that is not possible not possible and you right. lose uh, and you lose an important uh, uh, what account. we notice is the customers just keep getting bigger as we're yeah. able to, yeah. to fulfill them otherwise people can't even talk to us because the market now now knows about this industry so so yeah. two or three times is really uh, small it is um, I'd say with two grinders going all the time I think we were doing four to five tons just with that. Can, can I say something? Uh, it's not uh, how much you need those in that moment. If you are able to sell two or three tons or four, or four tons of chocolate, it means that your brand took has, off. Has potential. And uh, uh, by not giving to this brand uh, enough productivity and uh, a more reasonable cost, uh, you are not letting it uh, grow. And yeah, then you're not feeding it, or you're not giving it what it needs. So that was one of the next episodes I was thinking of is don't be afraid to reinvest yeah. back in your company now by buying what it's telling you to important. buy. You're, very important. Your company is always telling you what you need if you're yeah. paying attention because you'll True. feel the pressures in certain areas. Yes. There's always Whether it's a space bottom or neck. machines or yeah. people. Very true. Uh, uh, absolutely uh, important to, at least at the beginning, to uh, reinvest in the company. One thing that I have to say, I told you before, you have been very brave because you jumped from uh, 1 to, to 50 in terms of increase of production when you first uh, purchased one of our ball mills. And I understand that for you now, the ball mill uh, for 50 kilograms uh, is small, doesn't make any sense, it's true. But for many makers, this is a reasonable step. So when I say two, three, four tons per year, I would advise a, a, a jump as you did. Uh, you have been uh, incredibly brave and uh, time uh, uh, showed that you, you were right. Uh, not anybody can do yeah, this but type of investment. if someone's going to buy a 50 kilo ball mill, they're already going in pretty hard. <laughs> Many so, of them. depending on what that difference is to the 120 as far as a price, yeah. it could it's make not, a lot of sense. It's not the double. To... It's not the double. Maybe it's 20-30% more. Right. Uh, you have to consider that. Uh, we were speaking about that before. A ball mill 50 doesn't go alone. You need to have a pre-refiner. Right. You, you already have to invest where. in the other things anyway. So, uh, you can decide within a line uh, what is the most important tool that you want to oversize? That happens. That happens. And it goes back to what you were saying as far as once you're doing four or five tons, the, it already means that you've got some traction. Yeah. And so it justifies potentially going to that next level if you can get the bank loan and if, if, you, if you secure the space. But then you also have to have some money saved up. Yeah. If you cannot spend all of your money in equipment. Uh, if you have an established company and you want to reinvest, uh, equipment cannot uh, be more than 50% of your new investment. But if you're starting from zero, this has to be even less. I would say 30%. That's my advice, 30-35% of your budget can be equipment because everything else is going to surprise you. Uh, the costs related to the location, to the, the warehouse. Cost of learning how to operate. Yeah, but this... Even thanks to people like you sharing uh, uh, knowledge, this is uh, now almost sold. When you started, there was no knowledge available. You are one of those that are spreading uh, information, uh, sharing uh, your experiences. Many others do the same. Uh, today, it's easier. Today, it's much easier to start a business. Uh, uh, still, uh, uh, you have to consider everything that uh, can go wrong uh, uh, with your space, with the packaging, even with your marketing. So you have to be on the safe side. This is my, this is my advice. When the business is new, you need to be uh, uh, very careful on the size you start with. Uh, and 
this is just to prove that uh, we don't necessarily push for our machines uh, or for the bigger machines uh, among our uh, offering because it's important for a business to grow up uh, at the right rate well and one, one last thing on the whole like knowing when to buy the equipment and understanding that it's time to to go to the next step whoever you buy equipment from you kind of need support yeah and very important if you don't have that you're almost dooming yourself to fail very from the important. get-go it's easy for me to say that because we have one of i, I am so proud of our after sales service uh, we have uh, people available 24 hours oh, you guys and you have can invested say heavily into trying to support everyone with yes. your guys equipment and that's one of the the best reasons that we go with packing when we buy new stuff because we know that there will be uh, help at, within a certain amount of time because we can't be down for too long anymore. Very important. We really want to continue to provide our chocolate in a timely fashion to anybody who orders at whatever scale that we can deliver on. So we try to behave uh, like uh, we want our suppliers to behave with us. So uh, having someone that answers the phone or uh, a, a WhatsApp message uh, at any time is very important. You are saying that uh, being down for uh, one week uh, because something is wrong and you don't understand what is wrong uh, can be a very big problem for a company. And we, we know that. And uh, this is this this came even before uh, uh, being so present in the bean to bar industry. This is something we are very proud. Well, it's kind about. of the same thing that we do. It's customer service. Customer service <laughs> is so important. Sometimes it's just. Uh, it's very easy to solve uh, and uh, again with automation with uh, remote connections uh, you can solve the problem sometimes it's not sometimes you require a spare part and uh, having them available having uh, one of uh, our um, biggest uh, investments was uh, the company that we established in the US America has been uh, great with us uh, but America needs commitment so we have a branch here and in many other countries, we have our agents present uh, or uh, people that work for the company available anytime. And uh, this is uh, extremely important to be reliable. This is uh, one of the things that we spent a lot of money on that. And uh, we are happy that you are happy with that. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? No. I'm happy to be in Hawaii. Yeah. That's out of that. After Th thanks years. for flying all the way out to Hawaii to be on Craft Chocolate yes. TV. That was really nice of <laughs> that you. That was the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cheers. Cheers. Goodbye. Everyone. See you next time. Aloha.